Ready? Which is fun. A musicali jamu. Alright, welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is episode world. This is a podcast world 21, episode 7 of that world. <laughs> it's getting a little out of hand. I've, I've said that so many times, but it's now it's, it's off the rails completely. It's the, I'm still saved by the fact that the funniest part here is that when we came up with these, when we came up with the world design, I can't speak for you, but I was like, are we, we're not going to get past like world 12 or 15. I know, right? Like I was like, oh, I can use uh, this, this, it was the storage I was using at the time was from Google. And I was like, oh, I can use this. And then that's good for like 200 episodes. It's fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> we had, there was, there's not a video game in existence that has had more worlds than we've been to at this yeah, point. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I don't know. There's some long games, right? Yeah, but then those games don't have worlds. They just have stages. Uh, lots of stages. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're a video game music podcast where we talk about games and music. And my name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. We also talk about various platforming elements. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, the gravity in Mario, Super Mario Brothers, is very unique in that he drops faster than he goes up. But I'm okay with that yeah. in the sense that it's balanced out by the fact that he has that inability to, like, stop on a dime, mm-hmm. and he has a slow build up to a run. Oh my god, Mario Super Mario 1. Still the hardest Super Mario game that's ever been done, along with the Lost Levels, because it's, to be honest, it's just Mario Brothers 1.5. I mean, 1. Mario, Mario 1 is, yeah, the because like you get to like World 7 and 8, it is hard. Mm-hmm. But like really a lot of that, I feel like with me anyway, a lot of the difficulty in Mario 1 comes because I want to rush through it. Yes. <laughs> so... I never let go of the run button. No. Have you ever seen um, speedrunners go through it? Like, like a full glitchless every every stage, no warps? Mm-mm. It's impressive because they know exactly, like, it's like a rhythm game at that point, when to jump. So that they can jump on the edges of the pipes with the um, with, with the piranha plants. They, as soon as they land on the, the bricks on the steps up to the, to the flagpole, uh-huh. they don't stop. They just keep jumping. As soon as they land, they jump again. It's like pixel perfect. It's crazy. And that blows my mind. It's and so it much fun to like watch. Those levels where like the, the cheap, cheap fish just jump out of the ground yeah. like, on a whim. It's like, how do you plan for that? Well, you, I mean, I feel like because it's not random, at least it's not all random, they can know when to start getting there. If they get there at a specific time, it's going to be the same every time. That makes it's sense. It's really cool. So I've definitely played games where by holding, mostly games like Super Meat Boy, mm-hmm. where... If you hold down run and you start as soon as the level begins, as long as nothing in you know just deters your progress, you will always get to this spot at this exact time, which means the saw blade will be in this position, right. so you can plan for this. That's right. Yeah, shovel knight's the same way. Like also a lot of speed running in shovel knight is is really cool because it's all designed so that when you get to specific rooms and specific areas, like it's always the same. It's always the same. Uh, bullet hell games are also the same way. Bullet hell games are not random. Especially the older ones, the um, they, a lot of the enemies are always shooting depending on where you are on the stage. So if you're always in the same spot at the same time, they'll always shoot in a specific direction, and you can manage bullet patterns much better. Oh. It's all about that getting that path, driving the line. I'm coming back for you, Death Smiles Black Label. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I haven't played enough. Death Smiles. I think I only really played it at your house. The game is brutal, man. I, I never really got into the horizontal. I find I find that super confusing. I like to do the vertical shooters. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I, I, I think it's just different perspectives. I'll admit, but I can also imagine depending on how the game works, like how hard it is, how much more difficult it will be. Just like how certain, like back when you play DDR and they had like the arrows that could go up or down. Yeah, you would think it was such a simple change, but no, there were people who was like, if you made them watch the arrows go down, they would just break them. They Actually, do it. That comes that brings up a whole thing. Um, the 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 latest uh, it's called the KAC tournament in Japan. It's the it's the oh, Konami arcade uh, Konami arcade Kingdom championship. Yeah. yeah, and so they had um, the DDR Grand Finals. So uh, were held there in Tokyo. So the the point system there's like there's like a um, specific times of the year that you earn points by completing sets of songs mm-hmm. around the world, and then they pick the top like two or three players from each region of of the of the world mm-hmm. to go to Japan and, and compete. And Chris Chike, I think he's from California. He won five years ago or four years ago. Okay. And so he went up again this year too. And he he won this year. So congratulations to Chris Chike. Because he's, he's, his timing is stupid. Like there's no one better than him. 
um, but his opponent was from Japan, and he read the the arrows going backwards. Really? So if you watch the stream, Chris's arrows were going up, and, the, and his opponent's arrows were going down. And it's just like I think it's just that's just how he learned. That makes it's sense. Really like maybe if he maybe he started going there, he probably was trying to learn how the game worked. And at the, initially, that curve of learning arrows going up was breaking him. And someone yeah. was like, "Try this option. It can make him go down." He's like, "Wait a minute, this makes sense to me." So <laughs> the entire time he played, maybe he would go in there and always pick reverse arrows when he starts a game. Well, so many other um, uh, Konami rhythm games, all the all the the notes and things always scroll downwards. Yeah. So it just makes it makes sense maybe just to do that. I'm, there's in my case, I've been trying to get a little better with games. I've been getting inspired, believe it or not, by the listeners in the Rhythm and Pixels chat. So I love how this is like probably one of the longest lead-ins we've ever had, but this is a good chat to me. Um, so we, as a lot of people know, I started getting to that weird game hermit thing where I didn't want to play games anymore. I, I'm going to say you went, you went into the uh, video game hibernation. Yes. I like <laughs> yeah, that. I like that. That's a good way to put it. Like, I'm just going to take a break. Just take a break. Yeah. And I've still been in that position. Sometimes I feel a little guilty when I want to boot something up. But something interesting happened this month. Four in February happened this month. For those not in the know, four in February is a thing that people have been doing for years, actually, mm. as a means to read through their backlog. They choose the month of February to play through a minimum of four games, beat four games in the shortest month of the year. Why that makes sense, I have literally no idea. You're in luck. I think this is a leap year. Oh, I got one extra you day. You got that extra baby. day, man. <laughs> so, like, I just kind of ignored it. Like, I saw the post come up because I'm in the group for it. So, I saw the post come up. I'm like, eh, I'm not playing it anymore. And then people in the group started talking about it. I was like, so, what are you doing for 4 February? Everybody's talking about it and they're posting their stuff. Like, I beat this game. I played through this game. And here's the beauty of it. Talking about games for those... Big shock for me, right? Listen to the show. But right, yeah. talking about <laughs> games to me is the most fun aspect of playing them. I like discussing games with my friends. Talking through their experiences. So seeing people talk about the games they beat and their feelings on the games they've been playing. It lit a fire. And I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm beating the game this month. Yeah. I'm going to play a game and beat it. So what, is, what is it? It's going to be Blaster Master Zero. All right. At least that one. But then I also bought another game on a whim after that called Kunai, which I'm going to tell you, I'm early into it because I only started playing it yesterday. But I like it already. You play as the equivalent of a Amazon Fire tablet <laughs> in the future. And you get, like, you're like a ninja to so your Amazon ni- Fire tablet. You're a ninja Amazon Fire tablet. In a Metroidvania style game. Don't hate that word. It's effective. It's an effective word. It- but. You um, basically run around attacking sentient evil robots, and you're trying to help a resistance retake the future from, I guess, like rogue bots or whatever. But the beauty of the game is that, in addition to like the fact that your first weapon is a katana that absorbs life forces of robots, so you can heal. That's how you heal yourself in the game is by defeating enemies. Oh, cool! But early on, you get Kunai. Oh, that's a good mechanic. The name of the actually. game. That, that's got. A, that's a good mechanic. It's. A, I yeah. love it. I love it. Um, you get two kunai, one for your left hand and one for your right hand, and that's your grapple mechanic for the game. Oh. So if you want to climb like a a a a, a, cor- a, a vertical corridor, you throw a kunai to the right, then it's to spring you up. Throw it to the left, it pulls you over. So you're like, choo, 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 choo. Oh, no one can see me doing that, but I'm like doing like the Spider-Man <laughs> web fling thing over here. And then eventually you get the ability to like springs, like sling your shot yourself. So you put them in both walls and pull down and then launch up like the the mo- the the Traversal, the platform traversal in this game is a ton of fun. Mm. And I've been enjoying it immensely since I started playing it. Oh, is it only on Switch right now? It may be on Steam too. Mm-hmm. I'll have to double check. To it check might it even be on PS4, I would wager, but I know it's on Switch because that's where I grabbed it at. And it's a, it's a gym. Mm. I like it. And the OST is hoo hoo hoo. Oh, I'll have to check that out though. We'll, yeah. have, to, we'll have to do a, a, a modern, we'll do modern indie platforming. I like oh, that it. That sounds pretty good. There's so many of them, too. And then I'm going to actually work in our next episode. Maybe it's influential. Influential classics. So I wouldn't work oh, for that no, one. I wouldn't work for that. No, no, no. I've, I better change my track list. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this game that came out in 2019. <laughs> no way. <laughs> well, yeah, well, let's get started on today's topic. We're talking today about cards. The heart of the cards. Yeah, this is card games. The beat of the music. So that card. the heart of of the cards. <laughs> the rhythm of the cards. Uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> card battling, card playing, card trading, right? Card anything. Card anything. Cards, cards, cards. Yeah, that's right. Card, card, cards. 
Um, How do you like them? And I knew this would be a great topic. One, because it was originally for the guests that we were going to have this week, but then things didn't work out. But this was going to be a good topic, because I know one of Pernell's favorite games for the Neo Geo Pocket. That's right. That's right. And so I'm hoping he picks it first. I will not. Oh, come on. I actually didn't pick from that game because oh. it's not going to be too easy. I didn't pick from that game because I thought you would. Don't! <laughs> so just for the record, he's talking about card fighters. Yeah, it was a SNK. Was it Capcom versus SNK Card Fighters Clash? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the classic team-up versus fighting game that no one asked for on the Neo Geo Pocket. But everyone was so happy to get. <laughs> Very cool game. Um, but no, what would you end up going there for your first pick? Well, I'm going to go with an obvious one that wasn't that one. So let's start it off. Um, this is from Trails of Cold Steel 3, and the track title is Vantage Masters. And it's composed by Hayato Sonoda and Takahiro Unisuga. Possibly only one of them, hmm. but at least possibly both of them. Listening to Vantage Masters, the theme for the game Vantage Masters, contained within the game the Legend of Heroes <laughs> Trails of Cold Steel 3. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> Composed by Hayato Sonoda and or Takahiro Urisuga. Yeah, so that's gonna be a thing. How many how many game how many how many tracks today are we gonna listen to are music that plays during parts of games within a game? I will say at least one more. <laughs> so this game. Honestly, this is my favorite kind of card game in the video game verse, I will admit. Games where the card game is a fully developed card game, but it exists within another game, so that the card game is meant mostly to give you a break from the action of the main game. So you're not so it's not like Final Fantasy VIII where like you're you're kind of doing this card game to get so you can get extra items to do other things and I mean, there might be some sort of weird in-game bonus you get for it, or like I know maybe sometimes NPCs give you rewards, but for the most part, I was just playing to get more cards. Ah. So, like, what happens is early on in Cold Steel 3, in the new town that you start the game in, there is an actual, like, item shop that is also a card shop. So you go into this shop, and you can actually buy packs of cards with the money you earn in the game. And the lady gives you a starting deck because she wants to get you hooked on the game. And was, so <laughs> I love how they did that. And then so it's like real life. Exactly. Like here's your D. Here's a free pack of cards. Like they know what they're doing. It's like licking their lips, waiting for you to get addicted to it. Mm-hmm. But uh, then you immediately like sit down with these kids who teach you how to play the game, and it's a legitimately fun game that gives like it brings back memories of like something akin to like Yu-Gi-Oh, except the 
person with the life points isn't you. It's a card that's on the table. Mm. So you have cards that fall into a a variety of different categories and classifications, like fire cards and life cards and water cards, whatever. And um, you also have a master card. That card has a lot more life than the average cards and a different ability, but the difference is if that card gets knocked off the table, you lose. That's like considering that you let your king or queen or whatever oh, okay. die. Yeah, yeah. So you are playing this game, setting up cards that go on the front or rear or a line of the card battle table, and you're also trying to like link cards together, say like that can boost each other's effects. Like this card might boost this type's cards attack damage by like 50% if it's sitting next to it on the table. Right, right. There's like some surprisingly interesting little combinations oh, they put into this little simple game. That's amazing. Man, it's a lot of fun. Like, And while you can't battle every NPC in the game, there's a fair number of them that you can. Mm. So you'll just be walking around town, see a little icon over the guy's like, oh, I can battle that guy. And you're like, <laughs> I'm supposed to be rushing to stop this battle from taking place, but screw that! Vantage Master's time, baby! <laughs> And you set it up, and you're, it's, it's a lot of fun. I think it always cracks me up about like those mini games where it's like oh, the, the main game is like you're trying to save the world or you're trying to do something like bigger than yourself, and it's, it's huge and the stakes are super high. But I could just hang out for a minute and play a card game or race some chocobo or... You know what they say. <laughs> do some gambling. Self-care is very important. Oh, but this is an amazing track. This bass line is so cool. Mm-hmm. I love that slap bass. It's very, very neat. If there's anything that's going to make you want to play a mini game aside from the mini game itself being fun, it's the music it's the that music. plays during it. Yeah, and a lot of these, a lot of them from Final Fantasy also has really great music. Mm-hmm. So this is a good song to start off the, the show with. So my tracks, not all of them I know anything about, especially this one. <laughs> this is Card Fight, Vanguard, Lock on Victory for the Nintendo 3DS possibly composed by Takayuki Nagishi. I'm not super sure on that one. Mm-hmm. And this is um, from Card Fight 3. So this is a this is a, a series of games um, that started on wait, 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 the Super wait, Nintendo. Play the track. Play oh, the you want to hear the track first? Play okay. the track. All right, all right. We'll get there. Inches. Let me just talk about a game I don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Vanguard. Another Van... Oh, here's just Vantage Masters. I don't know, v. V might come back a lot more this episode. <laughs> the letter V. Uh, Card Fight 3 from Card Fight, exclamation, exclamation, Vanguard, colon, Lock on Victory for the Nintendo 3DS. This is Card Fight 3 from Card Fight Vanguard Lock on Victory for the Nintendo 3DS, maybe Takayuki Nagishi. Um, I forgot how I got to that. I think there were a few composers on the soundtrack or for a previous game, 
and his name was mentioned on a few of them. So I was like, he's probably him again. And so that's what we have. Takeyuki Negishi um, for the Nintendo 3DS. And so I picked this because I knew Pernell would like it because it sounds like the Falcom sound team. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's pretty good. You said it sounded like the opening to Spin Jam yeah, for the PlayStation. Was, yeah, it reminded me of an old, um, basically, PS1 puzzle game Yeah, where they're basically sending bubbles into flower petals to pop the flower petals. To It's it's weird. But um, <laughs> it was a great little game that was on a budget list at one point. But... The opening of this heavily reminded me of that track. So for a second, I was like, maybe it's the same component. Yeah, had maybe a, had a start on super long buildup. Um, this whole soundtrack is super cool. Like the, the the opening screen, the menu selection, the character selection, all the stuff in this game is really neat. The, fun, the funny part, I feel like um, this is this is us putting a question out to the listener base, to be blunt, because uh, for a while I kept swearing that Vanguard was a reboot to a mech anime that I watched way back in the day. Like, but I think that the anime I was confusing with was one called Van Dread, which was a mech anime in a world where... No, there was a show called Vanguard. There was one called Vanguard there was one called also? Van- I think, and I think it was... Um, it was like a, it was a divide between the sexes. There was like the men. Yeah, that's that's Van the, Dredd too. Oh, no, that was okay. That must have been the same thing. Maybe it was like renamed in America. Because like they come across a man who gets like I guess he like they capture him or something when yeah, they discover yeah, the, him yeah, and the, they the, realize that he's not different from them at yeah, all. Yeah, the women capture the men and they're like, oh, he's not a scary alien. But in order to make this super big mecha, the men and the women have to like work together. Yeah, yeah. I, I love mean, that. Show, I'm actually. saying that in like the nicest PG way possible because the show is just. It's just, it's anime. Yeah, I was going to be wrong. It wasn't, it's not like, like creepy anime, no, but it's no, definitely no. like it's stupid, definitely. like the guy gets punched in the face a lot for like walking <laughs> into the bathroom by mistake, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff. But like, it yeah. was, aside from that element, it was actually, a, I remember thinking it was a pretty cool show. Like, anyway, I liked yeah. it back the in the an- day. The animation was really, really neat. Yes, it um, was. But yeah. like, I kept confusing that with Vanguard, so when I learned about this Vanguard show coming out, uh, coming out, I was like, wait a minute, is it just like a child card battle reboot of Vandred, <laughs> which made no sense to me at all. But if there's an anime that actually called Vandred, or Vanguard, that we're both forgetting about, that was not about kids battling with cards, which is what this Vanguard <laughs> is, let us know. We may find out before this episode releases when we get to our respective internets, but... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm pulling up stuff now, but I'm like, I don't know what this is, so that's fine. Because like I know, all I know about Vanguard is that it's one of those typical shows where kids go to like elementary or middle school, and they just have to also be playing this card game mm-hmm. about mechs and like wizards, and maybe there's a subplot involving world domination and conquest that can only be stopped by an eight-year-old. What the heck? Anyway, I think I actually would not mind watching the show because I have realized that I have come to really enjoy watching shows where the characters are just playing games <laughs> and discussing their moves. Like, there was Yu-Gi-Oh! back in the day, which was oh, the beginning no. of that whole craze. That, that one with the ice shield, right? The ice, the, the football one? Oh, ice shield 21 was great. Yeah. That was that was the first time I realized that I could appreciate sports <laughs> if you make it flashy. If you make it flashy. On the, the Legacy Music Hour, uh, uh, this is like one of the early, early episodes from years ago. They talked about how Brenton was like, yeah, you know, I watched Rocky for the first time. And I never realized how exciting, you know, boxing could be. In a movie, yes. Because <laughs> in real life, you're like, ah. it's very. You, got, you gotta be really. You, you gotta really be into it. It's. I think it's like, uh, like professional video game esports too. Like you gotta know the sport. You gotta know the game. If you don't know the game, it's hard to get into the the, the personal story of the people playing. And I was about to say that's yeah. that's the thing that they need to do. They don't inject the personality, the people enough. Like if you watch Rocky. I'll admit, you know, in Rocky, because you watch the forty the hour and thirty minute build up to the actual fight, you're like, Rocky's fighting to put food on the table. His <laughs> wife is home pregnant. He needs to pay for the new TV. He's trying yeah. to get. So now he's in the ring. It's like, is Rocky gonna get that money for the TV? Can he win the battle <laughs> so his wife can afford to have go into labor? I don't know. His wife can afford to watch cable. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, but in a normal boxing match, all you see is like, okay, these two buff uh, guys are trying to knock each other out. He threw a punch. It connected. Yeah. He threw another punch. That one didn't connect. Like, you, 
there's no stakes in it for the know. viewer. You're just like, eh, they're punching and, and, each other. And the violence doesn't do anything for me either. Like, the ultimate fighting stuff, it's like, oh, he, like, it doesn't, like, I, I'm not, I don't know what I'm looking at. So I just see just like a, like a bar fight. <laughs> like so in you, a ring <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me so if you take this logic to something like this right like yeah. so well obviously there's no like well there's the equivalent so let's say you're at like a card shop in downtown yeah and kids are playing Yu-Gi-Oh yes. and you just watch a kid play a card and, and his opponent's like okay how am I going to counter it I'm going to play this card it's like alright they're playing a game on the show however there are stakes because they have world domination or the world <laughs> ending as a result for like the main villain yeah. winning so they're the hero has to win. In addition, they have dramatic music. So when a, a car gets played, it's like, mm. dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig -a what's yeah. going on? And then every character's like gasping and her eyes are bulging out. <laughs> what did he do? He just played Happy Cats. Happy Cats is a card so that goes in attack mode. So what you're saying is that kids are just playing these games completely wrong. What yes. they have to do is they have to play their card and yell out the name of the card, and, and then your opponent has to go, what? And then they have to have at least two friends behind them to comment on everything they do. No, believe in yourself. You can do it. You right. can win. <laughs> oh, my God. He just played Unhappy Cats. What the heck is Unhappy Cats? Unhappy Cats is a card that when it's played in attack mode, and actually goes feral and attacks the first two enemies in the vanguard oh. line on the opposing side. <laughs> it makes them go feral, which then makes them a turn on the opponent on their other Oh, enemy. my God. It gets ridiculous, but there's... I mean, obviously, we're a little exaggerating, but at the same time, I think there's something to it. And, like, the last example, you mentioned Ice Shield 21. Ice Shield 21, they are literally playing football. Like, if you took out... The yes. weird animations, like and the goofy names for the special things they do, they are playing football. The the Devil Bat's special move that they talk about the most is the Devil Bat dive, and they have like a bat that like kind of spreads its wings and like goes yeah, oh, like like, an an, like the animal bat. Yeah, that's amazing. But you know what it is? It's literally the running back jumping over the defensive line. <laughs> that is literally the move, and yet they have a name for it. They have an animation for it. They make it all dramatic. Sure. There's one move that I always laugh at. Cause I wonder if it's even a legal move in football, but um, it's not rodeo drive. It was the whatever the one, the, the Lance attack or something. Something like something <laughs> Lance, Night Lance. But the guy just like <laughs> stares this like stupid, ridiculously long arm, and he just like grabs the guy and just like yanks him. <laughs> Oh, and I'm that, like, I that, feel that, like that's not legal. Yeah, that's holding. That's not legal. <laughs> you can't, yeah. You're not allowed to do that. Also, it would probably really ruin your fingers. Oh, but he's anime. He's, oh. he's, he's got super fingers. Oh, he's got the Rock's fingers. Oh, yeah. Dwayne Johnson's fingers. And they make it such a dramatic animation. Like, he's like, he lunges back and his muscles contort. Oh, my God. And then when his arm extends out, it's like it's like ridiculously elongated arm. And they show the, like, the animation of an actual lance piercing the opponent. Oh, my God. It is crazy. But it makes it really exciting to watch. And I wish real football did that. Oh, man. I wish real sports did much more than they're doing. Yeah, they do. But you know what? I don't think it would change how I feel. Um, but what's your next track, Dad? I'm really curious about the games that you chose from. All right. Well, you're, once you learn them all, you're like, oh, this all make total sense for Purdue. Um, the next track I picked is obviously inspired by one uh, Stephen Miller because that's part of what made me want to think about this topic in the first place. Okay. This comes from the game Witcher 3. All right. And it's called Back on Path, composed by Marcin Prisbilowicz. You, you know what? Last week or the week before, you got that name perfect. And this time. This time, not so much. That's called Lack of Sleep, baby. <laughs> You're doing all right.
that's what it's called. BattleCon <laughs> Devastation of Endines. Now I remember. All right. Boom. But I'll still bring up the topic later. Okay. But as for the song itself, this is Back on Path from the game Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Posed by Marcin Prisbilowicz. Bam! Bam. And your face! Yeah, he, he couldn't even pronounce his own name as well as he pronounced that name. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And if he disagrees, he's wrong. Yeah. So he's back to back to his other names, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> That's his fault. Everyone's got a fallback name, <laughs> Marson Smith. All right. So the reason why I picked this track, yeah, because but- I've honestly yet to play this, is specifically because of Stephen Miller. He talked about The Witcher Three on our Games of the Decade episode. He submitted that track, and it got me thinking about The Witcher again, because quite frankly, I wanted to hear more of the music in this game. You even came close to interviewing this guy, but just didn't pan out because it was hard to actually get like coordination with their like their publicist or whatever you call uh, them. It's it's just, it's it's amazing like soundtrack. It's very it seems like authentic of like a period, you know. Mm-hmm. Really, really like, all the instruments sound authentic, which is really great. And like yeah, this I just want to try this, but the problem is. The game itself is so daunting to start from a time perspective. Like, you know how people always say, I don't want to start watching One Piece because it's got 900 episodes. Yeah. That's how much time it's going to take. The Witcher is huge. Which is a huge game. And when you start it, you have to settle in for a minimum of 100. You're minimum not, of 100. You don't toss a coin to your to the Witcher. You, you toss a couple days. You toss a jar of coins <laughs> yeah, to your it's, Witcher. It's time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the time. But the funny thing about it is that... There should be nothing really preventing me from at least playing Gwent, Mm -hmm. which is the card game that is played while this track is playing in a given tavern. Right. Because in addition to it being in the game itself, I actually went and bought physical versions of both sets of decks for Gwent, one of which I got, I wanted it so badly that I bought DLC for a version of the game I didn't own and then gave it to a friend. I think I gave it to Chris Baines. Oh. Maybe like two years ago. You hear that, Chris Baines? He wants it back. No, no. Yes, he does. No, I want to hang out with Chris Baines. That's what I want. (laughs) But, um, no, but like, it's just, like, I still wanted the car, I wanted the cars that badly. That means we can technically just play the card game. It's a versus card game, Hmm. so it's 1v1. Oh, yeah. But, uh, it would be cool. Just like, here are the cars. We're ready to go. We can even have our little phase in, phase out battles or whatever. It'd be, it'd be amazing. Um, have you tried the, have you, have you tried the TV show at all? I think you'd enjoy it. I kind of want to start yeah. it. The last couple of weeks or so, I've been like having random encounters with folks, yourself included on this, actually, where I'd be like, Witcher! Either they'll be talking about it, and I just overhear, or they'll mention it to me like you mm. just did, and I'd be like, how much does it tie into the game? Like, no, not really, not at all. And, I, or somebody I, say, I've never even played the game, yeah, but I've, I like I've, it. I've never played the game, but the, the, movie, the show was a lot of fun. I never finished it. But Heck, it, I even heard people say that, or not people, it was an article written that, the sales of The Witcher Three and the hours played of The Witcher Three on Steam skyrocketed when the it. when the TV show came out. Because if I was like open to playing games, but just watching the TV show, and then I was like, "Oh wow, this was amazing!" I heard it's based off of a game. How's the game? And everyone's like, "It's fantastic!" <laughs> you know, I'm like, "Oh, maybe I should try the game." So it's a good. Jumping it doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it's a great great jumping in point. So I may well just end up mm-hmm. watching the show at some point because I'm getting into like TV shows again as well. Like yeah. Now, Except for the good place, which I'm fighting the urge yeah. to watch those last two well, episodes. Well, you came into the house. We were watching um, Brooklyn Nine Nine with um, Terry Crews. Terry Crews, yeah, yeah, and um, Adam uh, uh, or, or is it Andrew? A- Andy Sandberg, Andy mm-hmm. Sandberg, and he's very, very funny. Um, and you still haven't started that yet, have you? I have not. I have a surprising number of shows I yeah. want to start. Like there's a show I found. I know, about I know awesomes. you would like that show because it's it's quick. There's like let me see. There's the Awesomes. And there's Brooklyn Nine Nine. Yeah. There's Eureka, which I finally want to start watching. Oh yeah, yeah. I started that like ages ago. That was, that's an older one, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. And there's like Supernatural, which is wrapping up. Mm-hmm. Good place I got to finish up. High Score Girl. I'm still watching. Oh yeah, that's one the piece. anime about like the the people who hang out at the arcade. It's good too. It's legit good. Um, there's that board game shop anime I've been trying to start up. Where it's literally just middle school and high school girls. I can't remember which of the two. Mm-hmm. They all blend together at this point with these shows. But they go to board, a board game shop and play actual, like, real board games. Okay. <laughs> and they talk about them. Oh, wow. And they try to make the rules, make sense of the rules. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I also want to resume watching No Game, No Life. Because even though I don't like the creepy subplot that takes place, the general show is really awesome. Is, that, is, is that an anime? It's an anime. Mm-hmm. But it's like we were talking about before with, like, called games. Where the premise of this which is a premise that I wish existed in real life, I won't lie, 
is that the characters get beamed to a magical world. So it's like, is it Izakai, I guess they call it. Where um, you get beamed to this magical world where there's like elves and orcs and all that. And there's magic and the like. But battles don't exist. There's no fighting. Because all fighting is done by games. Like oh, literal magical I see. games. I see. So these two characters come into this world and they are like stupid good at breaking and dissecting game rules and winning. Huh. So they ended all these like magical game battles where they have to learn the game's rules and win on the fly oh, against these people who are like trying to cheat them and stuff like that. Oh, it is it's really so, cool. It's so classic anime of people who get beamed into another world where the thing that they're good at is the thing that's going to save the world. Exactly. You know? And no matter how weird or minute, minutiae, like, tiny it is, like, it's it's going to be the thing. What do you do? I'm, well, I'm not very popular in school. I'm just really okay at using macrame. Yeah, it's like, I can, um, I can uh, spit raisins in the air and then catch them in my mouth again. It's like, oh, my God, in this world, that's that's how you... That's, that's what how, powers the magic engine. That's what fights dragons. The only <laughs> way to kill dragons. Did you know? Um, all right, so my next track is coming from a game you might know. It's Pokemon Card GB2. Ooh, Electric this, Boogaloo. Yeah, this is it's an Electric Boogaloo. Um, this is GR King Battle, composed by Ichiro Shimakura. Listening to GR King Battle from the game Pokemon Card GB2 for the Game Boy Color, composed by Ichiro Shimakura. And Shimakura is putting the Game Boy on a journey with this song. Electric this Boogaloo. Is amazing. I just had to get that in there. The, the Electric Boogaloo. Oh, maybe our listener Electric Boogaloo is actually the second iteration of something. Very possible. He's a he's a robot. He's yeah. like version two. Or Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he had a breaking experience of his own this year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he's a breakdancer. Maybe. We don't know. We don't know. He could be anything. Um, he would not tell you. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. I don't know why I'm just making jokes about him. I like that guy. Um, so, yeah. Likewise. This is, this is a fantastic track. Like, the... It really goes like on a complete. It tells a story from start to finish. I think that's a thing with with some of these like card battle games. Is because like you're just choosing cards to play and waiting for the computer to pick one to play against you. But that's all the charm you need. It's yeah, just so fun. So, but like because of that, I feel like the songs are a little bit longer. Like even some of these classic tracks, like this one here, it's 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 long. There's a there's a there's a section. There's another section. There's almost like a verse, and then there's that ending bit with that harmony. Oh, it's so cool. The hard note, there's the ending bit with the harmony that I wasn't expecting. And then there's the melody at the very, very end. That right here, here it comes. This is an idiot. So good. 
It's only for this little section. It's only for this little section. I am genuinely fond of this track, and it makes me sad it's in a way. It's because, elevated. Because I play, I actually still have the original, like, Pokemon card battle game for the Game Boy Color at home. Mm -hmm. And I like the Pokemon card game. I like card games in general. Just wish I didn't suck so much at creating decks of cards. <laughs> I got. I'd play them more if I could because I've bought. It, it's it's a skill. Like you get being able to to see it and like see the whole picture in front of you of how the game's going to play out uh -huh. or how it would play out is a skill because I don't have it. I don't either. Yeah. Like if you give me a pre-built deck, I can make sense of what's there and yeah. combine it. But if you're like, hey, Pernell, here are five thousand cards. Of those five thousand cards, you've acquired twenty five hundred. Of those twenty five hundred, make a cohesive deck that yeah. uses forty of them. Uh, so when I started playing Hearthstone on my phone, like I'm so early in the game where it's like I only have so many cards to choose from, and I'm like, oh, this is fine. I'm playing against the computer. I'm gonna start playing against people. I I feel like these cards will work for me, but I know that if I spend like five dollars and get like a hundred cards, I'm gonna be super confused. Mm -hmm. I'm just never gonna want to do that. And that's um, where I'm at now. Like I bought yeah. I've bought multiple Yu-Gi-Oh games over yeah. the years, like multiple, and every single one of them, including the Switch game, which uh -huh. I need to start messing more with. It's the same play out. They give you a starting deck of cards of 40. I'm playing matches and I'm winning them. I get a pack. I like that. I'm winning. I'm just winning. Oh, I am winning, baby. <laughs> I get a pack of cards. Of that pack of cards, I can easily put like four of the cards into my deck. Now I got 44 cards. Another pack of cards. There are a few more wins. Another four cards. Bam, slap them in the deck. Vengeance has 60 cards, which is usually the max I can come up with. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, now I got to start trimming this down and injecting more cards. And this is where I break because I can't just add more. I have to trim, and I have to con maintain a good strategy as I trim and rebuild. Right. And if you ask me to take a brand new deck of cards and create that, bah, and that's when the game falls apart. When the enemies start using decks that are stronger than what I've got, mm -hmm. and I can't create a new one that has an actual cohesive strategy aside from big monster does damage, I yeah, fall apart. That's tough. These games are hard. They are, they are really hard. Yes, they are. Um, did you ever seen like I remember when I first heard about the the card the, the Pokemon card games coming out like it made like on, on the Game Boy rather like the Pokemon card games like it was gonna happen right that's mm -hmm. like that makes sense but for the Game Boy or for whatever like it seemed like superfluous to me like to have it's Pokemon you're choosing a Pokemon you're choosing the attack and they fight. And this is a card game, and so I guess you choose a card, and then you choose an attack, and then they fight. Pretty much, I just always chuckle at the idea it, of like kind of the same. Pokemon card game, a video card game based on the card game, based yeah. on the video game, based on the TV <laughs> show. Was it the other way around? Actually, is the other way around because the TV show was based on the video game. But I still, don't know. I'm waiting for like the video game that's based on the movie that's not based on the video game, but it's kind of but has the characters from. I don't know. I'm like, sure it's coming. It's coming. But all we need is one live action Pokemon movie. I, I don't know what I'm talking about because I haven't I haven't played a lot of these games anyway. So, but the way attacks work in this game mm -hmm. is that um. You play the Pokemon, and then the Pokemon has two to three attacks below its picture. Oh, the Pokemon are playing cards. No! Well, actually, I'm sure there's probably some variant where <laughs> like you're, you wake up a Pokemon, and you're playing Pokemon with your trap so friend's souls. you're not carrying a deck of cards. Your Pikachu's carrying a deck of cards. And you gotta shoot Pikachu, you shoot Pikachu out. Oh, my God. <laughs> Pikachu's like, I got cards. That would be a dark version of this, though, where the Pokemon are playing Pokemon the card game using cards that contain the souls of their Pokemon friends. No, no. They're and you have to actually save and release the Pokemon souls by winning battles against Ooh. evil Pokemon. Wow, you went right to the dark place. You have to. You got sold Pokemon <laughs> cards. I was just thinking, like, the Pokemon would have cards with trainers on them. That would be cool, yeah, right? But that would be pretty hilarious. Like, you have, like, the ba all the different trainers you come across on the road. It's like, Biker Ginny. I play Biker Ginny. What does Biker Ginny do? Pedals very fast. And she's going <laughs> to do damage by crashing her bike into Baker Jeff. Like, well, I'm going to have my trainer evolve into something or other. What do you have to do to do that? Uh, about 50 million years. <laughs> and then maybe he'll evolve. That's like, how does he evolve? <laughs> well, first it's going to take 250,000 Poké Dollars <laughs> and about four years of education. And then he might evolve from a baker to a sous chef. Oh, that's funny. To <laughs> sous chef a, Jeff. It's a job system. Oh, uh, that's funny. All right, so what is your oh, go on your final track? Mm -hmm. Last track, what you got? Well, I'm, I'm having trouble choosing it now because I'm still focused on Pokemon the <laughs> Trainer Battles game, which needs to exist now. Yeah, I like it. Um, this comes from the game called the Trainer, trainer Card Battles. Yeah, Trainer Card Battles. You're actually playing the trainers, not Pokemon. Yeah. 
God, make this game happen. Oh, uh, cold Colin, Lock on victory. <laughs> <laughs> lock on. <laughs> this comes from the game Cold Set Revolt on a Nintendo 3DS. Oh, yeah. And the title is called Innocent Battle Victory in Sight. Composed by Kenji Ito and Chiami Takano. Or Takano. Or Takuno. Takano. Definitely Takano. Takano. Yeah. You're listening to Innocent Battle Victory in Sight from the game Called Set Revolt, composed by Kenji Ito and Chiami Takano. Hmm, this is a cool one. I like it. I, all, 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 the, all the horns, the, like the brass section in this thing, it reminds me of like sports, like a sports, uh, um, like a band, you know, like a high school marching band at a sports game. I think that's a very good yeah. thing to be reminded of here, specifically because of how the track is utilized in this respective game. So, Called Set. For you, if you listen to this show as a fervent listener, you should definitely know what Colcept is because I think I've obsessively talked about it in the past. But just in case, Colcept is a franchise that's almost a combination of Magic the Gathering meets Monopoly the Monopoly. Um, in which <laughs> Magic users, or magicians as they would be called in right. some circles, battle for dominance on a stage by summoning monsters from their deck of Colcept cards to take control of various land masses, which then can request a toll of magic energy from passerbys who deem the desire to land on their tiles and be jerks. Um, but <laughs> in the, they do negative like effects and stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can have there's like spell cards you can play where you can like simply siphon the energy from spaces or from other cult set mages. But for the most part, it really boils down to. I'm going to place a monster on this property to claim it, and then I'm going to upgrade the property with four houses <laughs> so that it requests more magic when you land on it. But then if someone lands on the space, rather than just like, ah. be forced to pay, you can actually summon a monster to fight for control of the property. Oh, that's cool. I like that. So it's like um, so your house, you put a house on Park Place to charge more rent, but in this one, you're actually putting a demon and upgrading that demon to charge more yes. blood. Yes, literally. But you could lean on that space and say, my house is better than your house, and it'll fight your house to the death. You have a real estate battle. <laughs> you have a real estate correct. battle. That's amazing. And it's honestly an addictive <laughs> sense of fun. And But what ends up happening as far as like this goes, like one of the main differences that this has is something like Monopoly, which as for people in the board game community know, Monopoly gets kind of trashed these days for like uh, how it plays and like how long the games take or whatever. But one thing that this game does that makes it a little different and honestly better is that an additional win condition is actually the only win condition because you can't bankrupt somebody and win. You mm. have to get a certain amount of magic energy and then cross the starting point. So when you get to the point where someone on the board is at the threshold for like, okay, this guy has enough magic to win the game, the music shifts over to like these incite, victory incite tracks. And in the case of this battle theme, this is the victory incite theme for this style of battle. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, time to go. He's about to win. Got to break his kneecaps quick. <laughs> um, but it's an addictive game. But it also leads me to an interesting story that comes to play where I was talking earlier about how I, I'm terrible at constructing decks yeah. and I get really flimsy yeah, about it. Yeah, you're bad. Uh, you hush your fuss. <laughs> I, I kick butt. I actually, I actually was a little bit better in this game because I was able to focus on like elemental decks. So 
there's four elements in the game, earth, fire, wind, and water. You know, the usual four. So the idea to do, to focus yourself to say, okay, choose two of those elements and make mm. decks specifically built around those. Right. Because even if there's like an element for a property you want, you can always use magic to change the element of the space to a different one. Okay. So you can focus, you can still focus on a specific like strategy, but then you, ha- you can spend points or other stuff to sort of compensate for that. Exactly. Right. Now, I was still struggling a bit, but for most part, I was having fun. Mm. Listener Mike Myers was playing this game back with him on the third 360. We used to play it together. Mm. But then what he decided to do, he has this penchant for just breaking game rules and saying, screw these rules are stupid. Yeah. So <laughs> what he'll do is he'll do something that kind of goes against the principle of how the game is designed to play and win. In the case of this game, which infuriated tons of people on the internet, he built a deck that had no monsters in it, which means he never took properties. Which is the core of the game. The core of the game is walking around claiming properties and then charging tolls. He, he never that. did that. Huh. So what his deck did, it was solely focused around stealing all the work other people did. <laughs> Crushing their properties. Clever. Stealing their magic. Yeah. So he just walked around the board waiting for people to do stuff, and then he just siphoned their magic away. And then he would just cross the finish line with no properties owned and win. And people would rage quit on him. And like yell at him all the while, like send him like evil, like mean messages, like you oh, jerk back. Funny. So it's something about like it's like it's annoying to get you know like back back in the Xbox 360 days. It's anno- it was annoying to get like hate messages, mm. but it also felt kind of good. Oh, it felt wonderful. <laughs> yeah, like, to know that you hit somebody so hard yeah, that happened. they had to send you racial slurs over the internet, <laughs> and it happened to be more than a few times. Yeah. Well, typically when they can hear my voice, if they can hear my voice, they, a lot of people would just put one and one, two and two together. Like, wait a minute, that guy's black. I have a line I can use against him. But uh, and you're like, oh, you're really clever. You're really clever. But you know what that means? I got under your skin when I knocked you behind out in that fight game. Yeah, no yeah. complaints here, baby. I used to get that a lot in Street Fighter Four. Like, I would I would take someone out with a, um, I I would play Abel, mm-hmm. and I would I would have like uh, sequences where like people just couldn't move. Like I would just get in the zone uh-huh. of just predicting the next step the person was gonna take and just knock them down, knock them down, knock them down, knock them down. Then I would get like messages back, be like, "Oh, you cheap player, doing that move over and over." And I was like, "I just knew what you were gonna do." But if the move works, you can't fault them for that. Like, the problem is, is that they were doing the same thing over and over again. Like, mm-hmm. stop jumping, stop jumping, stop and that, jumping. And that calls into question the thought of like, you know, was it what do people call it? Like corner grab? Was it when you when you lock him in the corner? What is the technical term for that? When you lock him in the corner? Yeah, when you beat a guy in the corner and they can't get out, and you're just like pummeling them so they can't jump to get out, and they yeah. can't. The corner control. It's corner control. Yeah, I guess. So a lot of people would call that cheap. I've seen people call it cheap. Like oh, you just kept me locked in the corner. <laughs> I couldn't get out. I'm like, I get that maybe some games maybe just not built well to account mm. for people giving options to get out of said corner. Like maybe like combos that can't be broken, that sort of thing. Yeah, but. A lot of the time, it really is just a person that just isn't skilled enough to know. Like, that's where they started coming up with this, like, roaming cancels and, like, burst moves where oh, you can, like, push yeah. people back. It's yeah, it, get out of corners. It all has to do with, like, your knowledge of, the, of your character, the knowledge of the other characters. Um, Street Fighter, specifically, is a game of space control. Mm-hmm. Controlling this, the, the space on the screen. Getting your opponent to a specific range that they have fewer options than you do. Mm-hmm. And so if you can limit their options, then you can have a better chance of keeping them in your space. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's what I like about Street Fighter and, and why it's so hard to get into it competitively because you have to know so much about it. And then all of the, the hand-eye coordination to, to, to employ it, you know, to actually like do those things. And the odd part, that's kind of why I like Pokemon too. Yeah, like, right? Because Pokemon, to me, is fighting games for people who aren't coordinated. <laughs> So <laughs> you know what? That's true, right? Yeah, because Pokemon you don't have to worry about doing quarter circles and and, and little dash moves and stuff, or even just the timing of it. Mm-hmm. It's literally just I have a stable of monsters who have these moves that are meant to compensate for these things, while also providing me a viable strategy to doing damage to as many types of teams as possible. Mm-hmm. The opponent shows up with their team. You're like, okay, time to put this into practice. And you have to know how to pivot if you see a guy come out with something that you didn't expect him to use. Like, yeah. can my team account for that? There's a really weird dance mm-hmm. that comes from Pokemon battles, and the only detriment I've ever had to them is just the time required to make Pokemon, which I'll admit, they've cut back so hard that it's gotten ridiculously easy to make Pokemon yeah. teams now compared to how it used to be. No more riding your bike in circles for like 30 minutes. Now, what's my last trick? Pokemon. I was, Ride I, your bike in circles. I was going to say Pokemon, but I already played Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon. Harder. Po- po- Pokemon. Pokemon harder. 
the, the po- uh, too fast two Pokemon. <laughs> too fast two Pokemon. <laughs> now I'm gonna go with this one. This is from the game Wrestle Angels Double Impact for the PC Engine. So there's a whole series of wrestling games, classic wrestling games on the on the NES, the Famicom, and the the Turbo Graphics or, or the PC Engine in Japan. Mm-hmm. That is. It's a fighting game of wrestlers, but you don't actually control them. You play cards. And so this goes way back. This is um, track number four, and the composer is unknown. Don't know it. Oh, I got to listen to more of this unknown. This unknown character, (laughs) yeah. <laughs> so good. It's a little repetitive, but it's but it doesn't it's, matter. It's really neat, right? A lot of the best Game Boy game tracks, for example, were quick and repetitive yeah. loops, but they were so good you didn't care. It's, yeah, it's it's fun. I love the little drum breaks. This is track number four from the game Wrestle Angels Double Impact for the PC Engine, uh, composed by Unknown. But I, I love that sound, like the uh, the, the lead kind of keyboardy sound. Yes, it, so- it sounds really cool. Like it's got like an echo on it. Um, so yeah, so Wrestle Angels. I have never heard of this game in my life. It's a, um, it is a series of wrestling games on the Famicom and the PC Engine um, where you play cards instead of controlling the characters. So like all your moves, so it's essentially like, it's almost like, like a, what's that old card game War where you play a card and it's like higher than your your opponents. It's also like kind of like BattleCon. Like the card game we played a couple yeah. of ways back, where it's like a fighting game, but all your moves are done with cards. Exactly. Where you only have so many cards, so it's almost like a rock paper scissors. Like you're trying to guess what your opponent's going to play. Mm-hmm. But it all takes place in this world of like female wrestling, where they're all wearing like you know seductive outfits and things like that. But it's it's, it's the it's the Turbo Graphics, so it's like you know it's super tiny. No, no one, nothing really. They're all any. chibi. Yeah, it's all yeah. It's it's cute. So, um, and it was popular. There's a lot of these games. Really. Yeah. I'm amazed I've never uh, heard of this. Never, be at, that least, big. Uh, at least two. This is the, this is the second one. <laughs> no, there's a few. There's a few, and there's a few like special editions that came out too. So maybe I, I was. I assume it's probably a popular manga that was turned into a series, or vice versa. Or vice versa. Right? Yeah, it could be. Um, but I, I, I knew that you would appreciate a good. Oh, this is a PC P- engine. PC baby. engine track. I mean, honestly, that's what you want to go see if there's any like fan translations of it. Because I'd play it on like the retro. Oh, there pod. could be. Oh, I just learned, or I just learned. I just I saw finally saw the, the preview for or uh, the announcement for the Double Dragon Kunio Kun. Yeah, uh, buddy. Set. I mean, it's not going to be like super full of features and extras, I'm sure. But they're going to have localized mm-hmm. all of the Kunio games, all the ones that we never got. And it's a great idea because like, uh, funny my second time mentioning the episode. So, around the, like before the time he... No, nah, he had the already moved. Because I think it was like maybe last uh, February, Mike Myers came to visit, and he brought his Japanese copy of this game with him for the PS4. So of, we dabbled in it. Of, of the Kunio Kun collection. Of the, of the Kunio Kun collection. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So, we played it then, and we were kind of discussing, like, you know, why is Double Dragon? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Double Dragon is actually originally part of the Kunio Kun series, mm-hmm. but in America it was called Double Dragon. 
But uh, I was like Renegade. If you remember Renegade, yeah, Renegade was in the series too. And that was the first Kunio yeah, game, the, I think. Yeah, I remember being like, "Wow, River City Ransom," and uh, was was a dodgeball. Though so familiar, but it was all they were all like kind of in the same world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like we played it then, and they had English versions of games that already had English translations. And the games that didn't have English translations, from what I call, did not, which sucked because we were like kind of dabbling in those games, but we didn't know what was truly going on. It was like, eh, it works, that's fine. But it was just something that even back then, I was like, I really wish this came out in the States because it just makes so much sense. It's an easy day one purchase. Yeah, it's really exciting that it's coming out. Do you know if the if the Double Dragon games are the NES games or the arcade games? NES ones for sure. That's good. I don't remember if there's <laughs> are. I can't remember if there's any arcade ones on there, but I know the NES ones are. I, I'm not a fan of the, the Double Dragon arcade game. It's very slow. I agree it's with you. It's very clunky. It, I mean, it looks cool, but it's clunky. The characters are all like large sprites, yeah. and while he looks large, it's like it, they have to compensate by them being like just kind of meh. Yeah, but I remember, I remember uh, Double Dragon 2 for the NES being confused as a kid why they looked like that, but they looked closer to the arcade counterpart. But like, they also added stuff to the NES game. Like, the first Double Dragon, they added the heart system so you could actually level up and learn new moves. Yeah, that was cool. It was the original game. That was none of the, nothing like that occurred. Nope, it was just left to right, beat them up. And then the second game, I never played the second game's arcade version. Not me neither. But I, I don't, the I don't game think there was a third arcade one. There, there might have been. There wasn't. I don't yeah. think there was. Third one was that weird one that everybody hated because no one could beat it. Yeah, that's very, very difficult. I finished it. I don't like. There are games that I swear when people bring them up, like, oh, I, I'd be like, I beat that. But I have to openly admit, I know I finished it, but it was also likely in part because I was a child who had infinite amounts of time right. to master it at the time. Yeah, and by master we mean memorize. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Learn the cheap moves and learn how enemies came out and when. Mm -hmm. Because now if I go back to play Double Dragon Three. Yeah, nowadays it's like, yeah, I beat that game using save states, mm -hmm. using every cheat I could find <laughs> to get right. through it. All right, I'm going to turn this track down, and we're getting into the bonus round. Look at you crack your knuckles. That's right. Bonus round. And the bonus round is the part of the show where we play covers and remixes and arrangements on our theme. We also play, like, curiosities, you know, like tracks with vocals and, and, and weird weird versions of songs that we don't normally see. So, Or if you're a Purnell and you came across... Actually, you know what? Maybe... No. I am <laughs> going to go with this. If you're Purnell and the only <laughs> thing you came across that you were going to play was a trap remix from Luigi's Casino on Super Mario 64 DS... And you're like, I don't think I really want to play that now. That's good. That's fine. You know, if that's not your if that's not your jam, yeah, I'll, like, I'll play it or I'll listen to it. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> so, like, instead, I'm just going to play another additional track for the show. Okay. But we'll mention that it's out there if you want to listen to it. The Trap Remix for Luigi's Casino from Super Mario 64 DS. Who, who did that one? I don't remember because I didn't write it down because I was like, I was listening to it. I was like, you know, I don't want to, I don't like this very much. <laughs> but at the same time, I like Luigi's Casino. So... But I figured that could be like the outro or something for the episode. But the actual track I'm playing now mm -hmm. is from a game called Reigns Her Majesty. It's called Emotional Labor, okay. composed by Jim Guthrie.
Welcome back. You just listened to Emotional Labor from the game Reigns Her Majesty, composed by Jim Guthrie. I originally played this on the Nintendo Switch under the game Reign, Reigns Kings and Queens, but I believe it was also on Steam and possibly mobile. Um, why would I pick this track for an episode devoted to card games? Well, one, I kind of feel like this might be the only theme I can think of in the near future where this would even fit. But the premise of the game I've always found to be especially interesting in that you are a king or queen who exists making proclamations. And all of your proclamations are done by swiping cards a la tender. Oh, okay. That's right. I I thought this sounded familiar. Yes. So there are four categories you're trying to manage. Finance, military strength, faith, and I can't remember what the last one is, but it's something. And every time you make a proclamation by swiping right or left on the person's request, you are either raising or lowering one of those bars. Mm-hmm. And if any of those bars get too high or too low, you immediately lose. We played this at Thanksgiving or, or hol- one of the last holidays, and, and uh, my cousin Rachel had it, and Christy was playing it on her phone. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Yeah, she kept messing it up, or like she kept like trying to do a, but it's it's really difficult. It's, it's surprisingly challenging. And there's like a yeah. weird added sub-element, too, mm-hmm. that they add to the game, I guess, for the purpose of just like giving an overarching play, which is that every time you lose, your character gets killed or beheaded, mm-hmm. and then your consciousness is placed into the mind of the new regal ruler so right. you retain your memories but you keep going as if you were a new ruler and right. there's like, it's a not like starting over again as like a, like a new thing it's like you're starting over again as the new ruler as a new ruler except you have all the memories of the past because you're the one who played it exactly right. and they throw like this weird element in there where there's like a mm. like a demon who's like you're trying to stop him or you're trying to like find the truth of self, something regarding this demon and the only way you can really do it is by deciphering a weird series of like puzzle requests that when they come through in the cards, you have to know which ones are which and then swipe them properly mm-hmm. to lead yourself down the road to eventually get to this point. Because sometimes you'll make a request, you'll get a request, and your decision will come back to bite you later. Because you might say, well, we need, there's somebody, we need military aid. This country's coming to invade you. Nah, we don't need to do that. And then like maybe <laughs> 10 requests later, the military, that country actually does invade the country. It's like, all right, well, you need to sacrifice your lead priest or we're going to raise that your villages or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And then you know, attack your villages again. Exactly. Oh, that's funny. It's a ridiculous. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, game. I'm going to have to look that up for myself and uh, try that out. And that's, that's on the phones too, right? Mm-hmm. It's on the phones. I just like think of it as like Tinder phones. Quest, basically. Yeah, Tinder Quest, yeah. Okay, so my next track, and we're redoing this again because I discovered that the track I originally chose was a meme from Brazil. <laughs> Still great. And I thought it was a voice actor singing Card Capture Sakura. No, it was very just a poorly. very drunk man. It was a very drunk man from Brazil <laughs> singing the theme song to Card Capture Sakura. So we're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to fall back on, on what I thought Pernell was originally going to pick from, and that is SNK versus Capcom. Card Fighters Clash for the Neo Geo Pocket Color, which is a, a, a great game with an amazing soundtrack. And this is the track called Joy Joy, which I you think it's from a, a location, like an arcade location in the game? Yeah, there's like different buildings you go to throughout the course of your playing the game to battle people. And Joy Joy, I'm pretty sure it's one of those buildings. Oh, man. This is a... This whole thing is... Actually, I've already played one of my favorite track on this, like in a previous episode. This is the Psycho Soldier Remix. It's so cool, but this is this is a really neat one, and it's a really cool sound chip on the on the machine too. So this is Joy Joy from SNK versus Capcom Card Fighters Clash. Thank you. 
Joy Joy from SNK vs. Capcom Card Fighters Clash for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. Now, I love how the Neo Geo Pocket sounded like a really clean like Sega Master System almost. I think it had like the same channels, but like the they sounded a lot cleaner, you know, a lot clearer. Maybe it's because it was in the stereo. It just got me thinking. Been like while this track was playing, so Rob was like, "I want to pick some Card Fighters," and this has been years. Since I bought the game and then never bothered to mess with it because it got a lot of bad press back then. Oh, really? But now I'm getting nostalgic for it. Not this car fight, but they made a sequel for the Nintendo DS. Mm. But when it came out, they didn't play test it all the way through. So there was an actual game breaking glitch where there was an NPC you needed to talk to at a certain point in the game, and then you had to battle him. And if you could win, you could progress further into the game. Right. But due to how they programmed this glitch, you were never able to trigger that battle with him for some reason. So you could never beat the game. Oh, wow. Or at least the post-game. But still, you could never get through the game. So you never get through the whole thing because this NPC was just broken. Yes. Oh, that's a shame. So they eventually patched it and re-released the cart. Because back then you couldn't patch games on the fly. Right, so some people had cartridges that just you couldn't finish. Yep. Oh, wow. And I have the copy of the game, but I never did check to see if I had the version that wasn't borked or not. So mm. now I'm going to go <laughs> and check because I'm curious. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. You can look at like the serial code or something on it? Yeah, there's like a picture of the cart that's fixed and like the serial code on it. In addition to like some of the cover art is a little brighter than the other oh, ones. I'll have to check that out. Well, for more information on the bonus round part of our show, which is not glitched, Go to rhythmandpixels.com, and you can go there to complete the game. We'll have more information on the artists and tracks and everything you need to know. And cheat codes. Yeah, all the cheat codes. Let's go! Thanks for joining us on episode 21-7 of Rhythm and Pixels, where we talk about card games and card games and video games. Video games that have card games in them. Card and cards. With also, and, and video games that have card games do also have card games inside the video game. And games where the card game is all in your mind the entire time. It's all in your mind, Pernell. Dojo Casino, I'm baby. stretch. Oh, Dojo Casino. It's all in the mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, you're a Chop Chop. It's not Chop Chop, it's Deal Deal. Deal Deal Master Pokemon. Deal Deal Master Onion. That's right. I like that. Oh, actually, no, didn't that happen in um, Parappa 2 where Chop Chop Onion became like a gambler? No, nah, no, nah, it was just in um, Jammer Lammy, she linked, she had like a representation, mount, like I guess like statement like lodged in her head that she would just constantly repeat when she needed help, like the battle on a stage, like, the guitar's in my mind. So, like, she'd go on a stage level, like, for like for example, I don't know, like, she needed to make a new guitar. Yeah. And she's out in the woods. She's like, okay, well, you can chop down this tree, and we can make you a new guitar. She's like, I've never used a chainsaw <laughs> before. And the thing we're in her, like, dojo, casino. It's all in the mind. Like, That's, That's what right. it was. The guitar is in my mind. She's playing the, gu- the yeah. chainsaw like a guitar. Yeah, because he's, as I was saying, that's where I remembered it from, because... Cause- he used to be like the the master at the dojo, but yeah. then he became like a gambler or something. But he can't gamble anymore, so he's like, "No, the dojo and the casino, it's all in the it's all in the mind." I like that Chop Chop Onion is just like this old crazy man. <laughs> I love those games <laughs> so much. Oh my god, me too. Um, I just want to play those games now. <laughs> it's sad too because they've tried to remaster the first game, and it's hard. It, it yeah. just doesn't quite work. So, like, I feel like the only real way to get the full feel of the game is to actually go back and play it on the PS2 on a CRT. Yeah, you'd have to play it on a on a TV, like, mm-hmm. a, like an old-school TV, in order to get the timing and everything correct. Otherwise, and even then, like, it wasn't really, like, matched up super well. But that's when you got stupid freestyles. Like, I learned that the best way to get combos was to play to your ear and not to the buttons on the screen. Like... Don't time it with the buttons. Time it to sound. Just hit the right buttons. Right, because the video wasn't all matched up that well anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a lot of those games were like that, but we loved them anyway. <laughs> Better believe it. I remember I played through, like Anthony and I played the first Parappa. Mm-hmm. When I picked it up from the store, I went to his house, played the whole game in one sitting. Like yeah. We were obsessed with it. That happened. We were um, with some, like, a long, like oh, God, this was about 15, 16 years ago, we had some friends come over at um, and Christie's old apartment, and I found Parappa at a flea market. And I was like, oh, this is great. And so we all were, we were just hanging out and like eating pizza or something. I just put it in. 
And I just played through the whole game right there. And I was like, wow, this is really rude. Instead of like talking to people. No, they got entertainment made, out of the I deal. I just made them watch me play through Parappa. They were entertained. <laughs> um, anyway, if you'd like more information about the show and my Parappa skills, <laughs> uh, go, go check out our website. RhythmandPixels.com. And if you'd like to send us an email, um, that's the best way to get a hold of us. If you have maybe a, um, a track suggestion, a topic suggestion, or if you just want to say some nice stuff, and we do read all of our emails. So. We've actually got some nice emails, yeah. some really cool topic suggestions, too. Yeah. Thank you, Andreas Milberg, for that. But yeah, please send us an email to our email address. Rhythmandpixels at hotmail.com. You can see us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. It's uh, usually uh, Rhythm and Pixels, all one word. You can just search for us, and, you, and you'll find us there. You can check out our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels, where we have a 24-7 live stream of music playing all the time. Uh, it's all 8-bit and 16-bit classics and deep cuts. And we also like to thank all of um, our Patreon members at the end of every episode. So if you go to patreon.com slash Rhythm and Pixels, you can help us out there. You get access to uh, prequel episodes every week, uh, the day before the episodes come out, which is kind of cool, and access to a monthly uh, live stream where we record a show with you guys, and one in front of you guys. It's kind of like a, a window into my office. <laughs> and I get to make weird googly eyes at the camera. Yeah, we can look at you, and you can look at us, and it's weird. Anyway, if you want to su- support us that way, it's uh, patreon.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. And we'd like to thank that Nick Walker, Mike Myers, Johan Perez, uh, Reinhard Zelkova, Andreas Milberg, Dan Loughton, Phantom Jest, Steve Miller, The Autistic Gamer 89, Cameron Worma, Christopher Stenstrom, Bobby Arson of One Up Funk, Ian Wicked Sufferoff, OK Impala, Kung Fu Carlito from the Heroes 3 podcast, Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version podcast, Brian Pitt, Chris Murray, Hammock, Hammock! from KVGM The Last Wave, a, a fantastic video game music podcast. So definitely check that out. Uh, Bruce Irons of the Mad Gear. Ed Wilson from the VG Embassy podcast. Um, I believe his next episode will have me on it. Dun, dun, dun. Did not check that one out. Uh, Alexander Proudfoot. Davey Cakes. The Dude. The Last Recon. Bed Roth. Kitsurito. Solace Sanctuary. Mix Six Master. Damian Beckles. Joe Vasallo. Chris Tienerson. Alex the Messenger. Messenger. Check out his podcast. The Messenger pre- is, is the Messenger the, presents the messenger? a VGM journey. I love it. The Messenger presents a VGM journey, and finally, David Smith. Thank you all very, very much for your continued support of our show. It's much appreciated. Very much appreciated. We have a guest next week, unless something happens where things get canceled. But we have a guest next. We have a guest for a few weeks. Yes, it should be nice. We have, we have a few guests. We got some developers. We got some musicians. And we got some friends. And I'm even reaching out on a ridiculously high limb to try to get a particular guest. If it'll happen, I think the eyes are not in favor. But if it does, that'll be cool. All right. It's a senator. No. <laughs> <laughs> senator Bob Terwilliger. <laughs> Terwilliger. All right. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll see you next week. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. Have a safe time. Have a safe have a safe time. Have a safe week. Have okay. a safe time, folks. Safe times. And remember, card games are great. There's so many different card games out there, all of which are ripe for the playing. Get your hands on a pile of cards and get to going. And a lot of people like to make the game a little bit sweeter in the form of gambling. Gambling is a thing that people like to utilize <laughs> to spice up game time, make it extra nice. But let's be honest here. Gambling can be a little problematic if you get a little bit too obsessed with it in the sense that you spend money you don't have mm. or obligations you can't mm. oblige. Mm. So I recommend making gambling not you know, wallet-breaking, but kind of fun. We've taken to eating ghost pepper gumballs when you lose. Yeah, make make wagers that will, you know, are, are, are painful to each other. No, Have fun. not <laughs> painful, just, just a little singy. Uh, <laughs> singy. Basically, just like wagers that are just wacky fun that you, you know, you do them, you laugh, you have a memory that comes out of it. And now it's not just a thing you did where you lost all of your money. You had to go home and explain to your wife where all your cash went. Now it's, you can tell your friends about that time you ate an insanely hot gumball because you lost a Super Bomber Man too, Francis. And, um, and it's kind of fun. It's enjoyable, you know. So <laughs> I prefer wagers that involve that result in funny stories and good memories with friends as mm-hmm. opposed to wagers where I regret losing $200 nice. on Pachinko. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody!
everybody. Good night. <laughs> and good night. And good night.